welcome to the Pelican Brief with your host, David Tapman. Welcome to the Pelican Brief. Thank you so much. I am your host, David Tatman, and we are here to report on all things Louisiana politics and Louisiana news. And so uh, we had a, a, a pretty stout election, not greater, uh, not great voter turnout, but uh, a pretty m- important election in Louisiana, where all of our statewide elected officials and all of our legislative officials uh, were up for election or re-election. Probably the most significant thing that I think of when I think about these elections is the fact that Jeff Landry won outright in a pretty crowded field in the primary. I've not seen that in my lifetime for an open gubernatorial seat. Uh, he got 52% of the vote. And I think you have to think about that as a mandate. Uh, you know, no runoff. Um, Sean Wilson, you know, everyone thought he would make a runoff, but Jeff was able to get over the hump. And now Jeff has not only, I think, a mandate uh, in terms of his role as governor, but also uh, a lot of time that governors aren't often uh, able to have uh, when elected because usually you would win it in a runoff sometime in November. So from November to January, it'd be a very, very tight transition period to get people into place. Jeff Landry winning this in the primary gives him a lot of time to uh, work on uh, transition and other things. And so there were a lot of uh, legislative elections. I'm not going to go into those. Uh, There were some big Senate races uh, across the state. Uh, You had... uh, um, you had some incumbents that were challenged. Uh, some one was defeated. Uh, you had uh, some pretty aggressive campaigns across the state. You had a lot of open seats where uh, senators were um, were moving on, and so you had uh, senators like uh, um, uh, Pope in uh, Livingston Parish, uh, and Valerie Hodges won that seat over fellow House member uh, Buddy Mincy. You had uh, other seats uh, that were up for election where there were some, you know, pretty uh, pretty hotly uh, contested seats, but where there were only two candidates. And another example of that would be uh, uh, the seat that uh, was held by uh, Bodie White uh, and a House member uh, won that seat, um, Rick. Edmonds is going to be the new senator. Rick uh, defeated uh, another termed out uh, legislator, a House member, Barry Ivey. Um, he had a challenge race out in uh, up in Shreveport, uh, and uh, we lost uh, Senator Robert Mills, who uh, was a great senator, and uh, we have a new senator in that in that race, and so. Um, we, I didn't cover them all, but I will cover some of the races that are going to be coming up soon. Uh, those races are mostly in the House. There, there are two uh, Senate seats that are up, um, and uh, I'm going to get to that in a second and make sure I've got everything in front of me. So, you, you know, in the House, let's go there first. So first off, you've got uh, a House 4. Uh, you've got a runoff between Walters and Green. Uh, that They were both at 34 and 33 percent. They're both Democrats. That's going to be a very, very close race. And um, House District 18, you've got incumbent Representative uh, Jeremy Lacombe, uh, who is, uh, had 43 percent of the vote, will be taking on Tammy Fabre with 38 percent of the vote, and those are both Republicans. Uh, you got Travis Johnson, uh, who had 49% of the vote. How brutal is that? Uh, one more, well, two more percent, one, one more percent and one vote, and he wins. But he's in a runoff with uh, Jamie Davis Jr., uh, who had 44% of the vote. So that will be an interesting race. There's a few other races out there. Uh, House District 23, uh, Tammy Savoy with 36% of the vote, Sean Mito. Mina with 29% of the votes. Those are uh, Democrat, uh, both Democrats in that race. You got Jessica, 
uh, House District 53, Jessica Domang and, and Kurt Guidry are both uh, Republicans. Uh, you got House Bill, House District 57, Sylvia Taylor with 17 percent, made the runoff with 17 percent against Russ Wise uh, with 16 percent. And that's uh, uh, Sylvia Taylor is a Democrat and Russ Wise is an independent um, you got a, another race with an incumbent. Barbara Carpenter is running against uh, Chana Banks, who's a local metro council person in Baton Rouge. Uh, Barbara finished with 41% of the vote, uh, Chana with 33% of the vote. Um, another very, very uh, close to winning race is uh, House District 64. Kelly Dickerson had 49% of the vote, uh, almost won it in the primary, and is in a runoff with Kelly Alfred, which I think some people thought might have been a surprise because Frog Talbot, a sitting council person, was in that race but did not make the runoff. Um, another very interesting race in the Baton Rouge area is House District 65. Uh, Brandon Ivey, that's Barry Ivey's twin brother, who lost the Senate race to Rick Edmonds, he with 32% of the vote, and Lauren Ventrella with 28% of the votes. Both of those are Republicans. Um, in House District 66, you have uh, two Republicans. You have uh, Emily Chenever, who uh, is uh, uh, here in Baton Rouge, and Rick Edmonds, who is also in Baton Rouge. And Emily had 32% of the vote led. And Rick Edmonds, who Richie Edmonds, who is Rick Edmonds' son, had 27% of the vote. That would be a very very close race. Another incumbent race here in Baton Rouge. Seems like there's a common theme here. Um, in House District 70, incumbent Republican Barbara Freiberg had 39% of the vote uh, to Democrat Steve Myers, 27% of the vote. That's a, a an R versus a D race. Um, Peter Egan with 47% of the vote is in a runoff with Buffy Singletary. They're, they're both um, on the North Shore and uh, both uh, Republicans. Republican in House District 75, Republican John Weibel had 48% of the vote, and uh, Democrat Kelvin May had 26% of the vote. John is a Republican, uh, and Mr. May is a Democrat. Um, in the House District 89, seat on the North Shore of uh, uh, Lake Punchatrain, um, Kim Carver had 44% of the vote and is in a runoff with Josh Allison, who's uh, an attorney. Uh, they're both Republicans. Kim Carver's a banker and, and, and many other things. And uh, uh, Mr. Allison is an, an attorney. Um, uh, another incumbent that uh, has a race in front of her, and that's Mary Dubasson, 48 percent of the vote against Brian Glorioso's 44 percent of the vote. Uh, this is uh, uh, an all Republican uh, showdown. And then in um, again in House District 103, Mike Baham had 40 percent, 47 percent of the vote, to Richard Lewis's 32 percent of the vote. Both of those are Republicans, and that is just as we know affectionately referred to as Shalmet. So that race is down in Shalmet. And then um, down in near the mouth of the river, Plaquemines Parish, uh, we have House District 105. Uh, Jacob Brode uh, is a Republican, and he's running against incumbent Democrat uh, Mac Cormier. So that is uh, the House races. And so there are a couple. There's a race up in North Louisiana. Um, uh, uh, Representative Jenkins is running against uh, uh, Representative Cedric Glover. Uh, that is um, uh, going to be uh, an interesting race. Um, so there are a, a number of races that still need to be um, decided. Uh, and um, another one, for example, is Dixon McCacon, who uh, McMakin, sorry, Dixon, 31.7 percent against Belinda Davis, who sits on Bessie, 31 percent. Um, and Davis is a, a Democrat and um, Dixon is a Republican. And so. Uh, there, there's a lot of races out there. We, we have had, and this is also unusual for Louisiana politics, we had a really low voter turnout. I predicted that in one of our earlier shows, um, not because I'm smart, but because I listened to John Cuvion and others who are a lot smarter with that stuff than I am. And um, 
you know, they, they, just all of the what you, usually when you have an open governor's seat with all of those candidates, all of those television ads, uh, you know, regional fights, all of those things, you just see a much larger voter turnout. And we just didn't see it. And it 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 appears, though, as though it will be even worse for the primary because we will not have a governor's race in the uh, I mean, in the runoff. Uh, general, I guess, is the right term. We will not have a governor's race in the general. We already have a governor. We will not have a lieutenant governor's race uh, in the runoff. We already have a lieutenant governor. Uh, we are we already have an insurance commissioner. So there's a lot of statewides that were already uh, decided, but there are some other important statewide offices that we really uh, sh- people should care about. So. In the uh, race to succeed, Jeff Landry, uh, Liz Merrill uh, is running um, and is running against, um, uh, struggling with her name right now, but um, Liz is expected to win that race. The polling that I have, uh, the fact that I can't remember the name is a little embarrassing, but uh, Liz is going to win that race, but she only wins that race if people show up and they actually vote, right? And that is going to be like a really, uh, really, really key uh, point. It's it's incredibly important to um, to get out there. I'm sorry, Liz's opponent is Lindsay Cheek. So Liz, uh, Liz is the current solicitor general in the attorney general's office. Liz is an amazing lawyer, amazing human being. Uh, and I mean, you know, look, a good friend of mine. I'm, you know, I'll pull no punches. Um, Liz should win that race going away. Uh, there were a number of Republicans, and if you simply took a third of that, uh, she would win that race. But you got to get out there and 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 you got to vote, and that's going to be something that we're really going to be pushing. I'm excited about Liz in that race. I hope she wins. She's an amazing um, lawyer, amazing human being, and she's doing a great job as Solicitor General, and she'll be a great Attorney General. Um, another race that it was really, really a crowded field uh, is Secretary of State. So if you care about election integrity, if you care about uh, honesty and integrity in the elections, this race matters to you. Make sure your vote counts. And um, so in that race, again, uh, amazing. It was just so many people in the race uh, both um, Nancy Landry, the Republican, and uh, Gwen Collins Greenup, the Democrat, both got 19%. Now, uh, Nancy had about 1,000 more votes, but just to give you an example, Mike Francis was at 18%, did not make a runoff. Clay Sheck Snyder was at 15%. So when you look at that race, I think it's pretty clear that Nancy's got the inside track to win that. Um, you take the Republican vote, you put it all together again. Nancy should win that race going away. She won't act that way because that's not how she is. But uh, it is uh, an important, uh, an important race. Um, the state treasurer is also up for election, and so there were three people, uh, main people in that race. Uh, the uh, John Fleming got forty-four percent of the vote, um, and Dustin Granger got thirty-two percent of the vote came in second. And so the runoff is between John Fleming and Dustin Granger. And if you just do the math, Scott McKnight got 24%. All John Fleming's got to do is get 6% of that. And he is the treasurer. And I truly believe that John will win that race. So those are uh, the big races. Again, I don't think I could emphasize enough the fact that people need to get out and vote. They need to go make things happen. Um, as we get uh, to um, the transition, which is happening now, as we get through that, you're going to hear a lot uh, from me uh, on that. The two big players in Jeff Landry's transition are Lane Grigsby and um, uh, former gubernatorial candidate uh, Eddie Responi, who ran against uh, John Bell, um, Boise Bollinger is also involved in that, as well as a number of other people. And so um, the transition subcommittees have been set up. There are a lot of familiar faces on there. 
Um, we're going to see exactly the direction that Jeff uh, takes us, uh, Governor Landry, I guess we should start calling him, or Governor-elect Landry. Um, the governor has, from the very beginning of this campaign, has talked about crime as being one of the biggest issues across the state of Louisiana, and that is true. Every poll that I see, crime is either number one, two, or three, and most of the time it's number one. So the governor is going to call, or he said he will call a special session uh, prior to the regular session, uh, which begins in March, and address issues related to crime. What those issues look like, we will see. We will see how the governor crafts that call. But I think we're going to start getting some information on that soon. The governor wants to, for by all indications, this is not a personal conversation, but by all indication wants it to be limited to crime. Uh, so that he can stay focused on what he promised voters and to try to address some of the issues that voters most care about. Another major issue in the state of Louisiana is insurance. It's not sexy, but people are having uh, just a hard time getting insurance. When they get it, it's so expensive, they really almost can't afford to pay for it along with their house note. Um, you take car insurance, which continues to uh, grow uh, and, and, and be more expensive. You take homeowner's insurance, which continues to grow. We have, we have a major crisis that our insurance commissioner, Tim Temple, wants to address head on. He would like to have a special session on insurance issues. And that may happen too, but right now the governor has not uh, suggested he call that. Remember, there's only two uh, people who can call uh, a special session, that is the governor, and then the legislature collectively can call for a special session. And so I think there's an outside possibility we would see two set, two special sessions, one on crime first, and then perhaps one on insurance before we go into the regular session. But that remains to be seen. Tim Temple, our new insurance commissioner, is working very hard. Uh, I see him everywhere. He is working with everybody to try to come up with some solutions to address our property insurance issues, our auto insurance issues, and our flood insurance issues. Of course, there's not much he can do about that. We're going to have to, we're going to have to work, depend on our congressional delegation for that, but that, that is what we can expect to see. So what are some of the other big issues? We, we know that uh, as we change into a new um, a new election cycle that we will have new leadership in the Senate and new leadership in the House. The Senate appears to have solved that uh, problem, that challenge, and has uh, looks like Cameron Henry from Metairie will be the Senate president. Uh, I think everyone is in agreement on that. Cameron was a House member for 12 years, uh, very knowledgeable about state government, has been you know a great House member and has been in the Senate for four years. And it looks like Cameron will be president of the Senate. In the House, that situation is more fluid. Um, indications are that uh, the candidates that are most expected to get that position would be Philip DeVille from uh, Eunice, Louisiana, um, and Daryl Desitel from uh, the Marksville area. Sorry, Daryl, I don't know your district exactly. Um, and then perhaps some others that uh, may emerge. Um, Jeff Landry recently suggested that there were six people that he would be pretty comfortable with being speaker, but that was a matter that the body had to address. And there were some other notable people like Tony Bacala from Ascension Parish, uh, um, Julie Emerson from Lafayette Parish, uh, um, uh, uh, Jack McFarland from uh, North Louisiana. He's got a lot of parishes in his district um, and others. So we will see. The other thing we're really going to be paying attention to is how the committees are composed. So the committees of jurisdiction will be set forth by the president of the Senate uh, and the Speaker of the House. I think the Senate's probably going to be a little bit more predictable uh, just because we know a lot about Cameron, but in the House, depending on who the Speaker of the House is, that is what what the committees will look like. I do believe on the issues that uh, are most important to uh, the people of Louisiana, you're going to see 
committees that deal with crime, like administration and criminal justice in the House and you'd see in the Senate, uh, are going to be probably uh, have a good majority of those people who are concerned about crime across our state so that those bills can get out of those subject matter jurisdiction. But we'll see because there's a lot of things that are fluid um, right now with the leadership. And as soon as we know that, we will begin to see the personality of the next four years develop. Do not be surprised if you see some key individuals who are elected officials, uh, uh, namely House members or Senate members, mostly House members, who may be called upon to serve in either a an administrative type uh, position, like, for example, maybe they pluck a uh, House member out of the House of Representatives and maybe put them in charge of the Department of Transportation. Uh, rumors out there are that former Speaker of the House, Taylor Barra, will be the Commissioner of Administration. Again, I didn't talk with Taylor nor Jeff about this, but that is one of the rumors that is out there. There's also so a rumor out there that Representative Mark Wright could be uh, the head of transportation. That would be Sean Wilson's old job. Mark has been chairman of the Jurisdictional Committee, and so... Uh, if you have someone that knows a lot about something, sometimes it's better to pull them out and put them in your administration and put them to work. And so I think those things will develop as time goes on. Uh, if that happens, you'll see some special elections to fill those seats. Um, the Republicans will have a supermajority in both bodies um, with a little bit of spare. Um, and so we will have a Republican governor. All statewide elected officials will be Republican, and, and all but one member of Congress uh, is, are Republicans. So the Republicans really gain control in the Louisiana legislature. Speaking of Republicans gaining control or lack thereof, it's been eventful from a federal standpoint. Um, obviously, Speaker McCarthy was uh, dethroned as Speaker of the House. And there were a number of candidates, so we'll not go ad nauseum through that. But I would tell you that obviously a lot of people were pulling for Steve Scalise to get that job. He certainly earned it. Uh, he's been a, a, a loyal and faithful follower of the party uh, as a majority leader in the House. Uh, he did not get it. Uh, he actually didn't even let them take a vote. Um, was an interesting comment you know they apparently there were a lot of people who wanted a lot of things in order to vote for Scalise and I think uh, Steve just wanted to be honorable about it and just vote for me if you think I'm the best guy to lead the house so after a couple of other candidates came and went eventually to everyone's surprise Mike Johnson from Shreveport uh, became the speaker of the house of the United States representatives and that's amazing. So now Louisiana has the one and two ranking uh, members in the in the United States Congress, and and so that should be good for Louisiana. Um, things are as dysfunctional as ever in Washington, uh, but I do think that if they get their collective act together, the future is bright for Louisiana. Uh, to bring infrastructure dollars in and to be able to do the sort of things that we want to do at the federal level. So I think what uh, that's kind of an overview of everything that's going on. Uh, you know, just want to be sure that not only I, I would imagine that most of our subscribers and followers, I think they vote. I would venture to say that uh, – 95 to 100 percent of our subscribers vote on a very regular basis. And so I want to encourage uh, everyone uh, to do that. Uh, I want to in, uh, early voting is going on right now. And so I want to encourage everyone to try to early vote, uh, get to the polls. But more importantly, I want you to get your friends to vote, to get your families to vote. It is an incredible right and privilege to vote. Uh, it matters. Um, all three of those statewide races are important. There are four constitutional amendments that I'm not going to go into, but if you want to know how I voted, uh, you can email me, and I'd be happy to share that. Um, 
some good things can be happening. Uh, you know, there's some outlying discussion of a potential uh, constitutional convention. Um, there is a lot of talk about fixing our insurance problems, our crime issues, uh, and uh, uh, our state needs it. I'm talking about tax reform and restructuring taxes to make it more affordable. Look, my my son left the state to take a job in Virginia. He, he spent his whole life in uh, Louisiana, educated at uh, LSU as a mechanical engineer, and to go get the kind of job that he wanted, he had to go out of state. And all of his job offers were out of state. And he has a lot of friends that graduated from LSU that are working in Virginia with him. We've got to we've got to spin that around. We talk about the brain drain and about the fact that people are leaving. They're leaving for opportunity. And the only way we're going to get them back is to have opportunity here. My son would come back in a heartbeat if he could, but the jobs are just not here. And so um, that's my plea to Jeff and the transition team, bring those jobs back, bring my son back home, keep retirees here so that they can spend all that money that they made in the state of Louisiana right here in Louisiana, uh, as opposed to making it in Louisiana and go and spend your retirement nest egg in Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia. These are all real life stories. Alabama, look y'all, Mississippi's kicking our butt. So, um, so that's it. That's our show. I hope uh, that that was helpful. If it was helpful in any way, um, just remember you can, if you're not following us, go in and subscribe. And that way when the shows come out, they go right to your phone or your device or your computer, uh, you can subscribe uh, to our podcast right there. Just hit subscribe. If you want to follow us on social media, social media is at Pelican Brief 225. Uh, if you want to watch us on YouTube, if you want to look at this mug, uh, you can uh, follow us on, at, on YouTube. It's at the Pelican Brief 225. And of course, you can email us at uh, the Pelican Brief 225 at gmail.com. So we're going to continue to sort of have little, little uh, snippets where we kind of talk about what's going on. But once we have leadership, we're going to try to get leadership to talk to them, to get them to come out to our audience. Our audience growth has been incredible. Uh, we want to thank everyone who subscribes, follows, please share, tell your friends about it. And let's try to, uh, let's try to learn what's going on into government. So we get it done together as opposed to getting it done to us. So I am David Tapman. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with you. And until next time, we are the Pelican Brief. <laughs>